I'd also like to welcome uh, Pam Workman uh, to our group. Uh, she joined uh, the group today, so uh, we can all welcome her. Um, the first two sessions we concentrated on the uh, history of, of Poland, and we're going to move to Poland's neighbors uh, today, and then as we, we go, we'll work our way on south. So I will go ahead and put up the screen here and uh, So we're, we're talking to, today about uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And uh, as you can see on the map here, um, these three states border the um, Baltic Sea uh, on the west, and they, they, they basically border Russia on the east. And uh, there's a, a little sliver that's at the top of Poland and at the southwest corner of Lithuania, which is the uh, Kaliningrad Oblast, which is uh, part of Russia, yeah, even to this day. And then, of course, as, as we talked about the history of Poland, uh, Lithuania for centuries included the area that's uh, shown as Belarus and uh, also Ukraine. So it, it, the Lithuanian duchy was a, a really large country for many, many centuries. The Baltic area is bounded by the 54th parallel on the south and the 60th parallel on the north. Uh, the significance of that is the 60th parallel is the, is the Arctic Circle. So you can see the top of Estonia is sitting right, right on the south end of the Arctic Circle. Um, and it's between uh, 21 degrees east and 26 degrees east. The climate is uh, tempered by the uh, Atlantic Gulf Stream, which flows up through the uh, uh, south of Scandinavian countries and up on, on, on through the Baltic Sea. Uh, I've, I've spent uh, many summers uh, north of the 54th parallel, and uh, the climate where I go north of the 54th parallel is uh, very, very cold in the wintertime. Uh, and uh, gets a lot of snow. And I, th I think uh, that's kind of true for the area we're, we're talking about too, that they do get a fair amount of uh, snow and cold weather. Uh, the land in the, um, the free Baltic countries is, is uh, relatively flat and uh, contains lots of uh, swamps and bogs and small lakes. The uh, Baltic Sea contains a lot of uh, small uh, islands to a couple islands that are big enough to where they actually support decent sized populations. The whole Baltic littoral was uh, unoccupied until <laughs> about 11,000 BC. Uh, prior to occupation, the entire area was covered with ice. <laughs> in the last uh, Great Ice Age, the ice sheet went to uh, uh, as far south as uh, Belarus. Lithuania became the first area that was free of ice, and that was in about 14,000 BC. And by 11,000 BC, Estonia was free of ice. So the initial settlers uh, 
were wandering hunter gatherers. And of course, they were people that were looking for easy to find game. Uh, by the Bronze Age, which is normally considered to be about 1800 BC, the uh, lifestyle had uh, changed to farming and they were growing wheat and barley. And they domesticated cows, goats, sheep, and pigs in this area. The uh, northern Baltic area was uh, settled by Finno Yurgi people. Uh, and the southern area was established, was uh, settled by settlers that came from the southwest. By the Iron Age, the uh, settlers had uh, gathered into tribal groups and were in contact with Scandinavian and, and the Rus people to, to their south. Uh, the Lithuanian uh, settlers developed many flint stone tools. They had, they had the access to, to, to more good rock to make flint tools. The Estonians uh, who were in the, in the far north didn't have access to much in, in terms of Good rock for stone tools, and so most of their tools were, were bone or antler type tools. By the uh, Neolithic period, that's 5,000 BC to uh, <laughs> that's not 50,000, it's 5,000 to uh, 1500 BC. Uh, ceramic vessels were in use, and so uh, in, in remains from 4,000 to 1800 BC, they found what they call combware. Uh, and from 3000 to uh, 1800 BC, there was pottery, it's called corded pottery. So this is the decorative treatment that was on the pots that they made. Uh, by 1800 BC, the uh, Bronze Age had, had of course started in uh, Europe and the bronze tools uh, came from Scandinavia and Central Europe as this area didn't have, uh, they didn't have access to, to copper and tin ores. Around 1500 BC, uh, the Iron Age started and uh, the, the Baltic states did have access to bog iron. And so they were able to make their own iron tools uh, and, and did start making iron tools in about the thousand BC generation. Um, by 500 uh, to 450 BC, the, the Baltic states had transitioned from uh, hunter gatherers to farming, and the farmers tended to be peasant uh, kind of farmers. The Roman historian uh, uh, Tyrannus Tess in uh, the first century AD. Uh, did describe in his writings the existence of Baltic tribes engaged in gathering amber from the Baltic Sea. And of course, at this time, amber was one of the rarest uh, type of adornment type of, uh, I guess you call it jewel that people used. And, and of course, amber is uh, resin from uh, trees that entrapped usually little small insects and whatnot. And uh, it's very, very old. And it, it was found in, in uh, uh, along the Baltic coastline as it washed out of the, out of the ocean. By the fifth to sixth century AD, the Lithuanians uh, were kind of grouped into three different groups. There were um, uh, the, the Zamatians, the Samogitians, and, the, uh, and, and then there was a group of Highlanders that were called the Oxstatians. And then the um, people who lived in the Latvian area were, were the Litigallians, and uh, the Lets were refugees from uh, Belarus. Um, that had moved to that area due to the uh, Slavic invasion in the fifth to seventh centuries in Belarus. The area around the Gulf of Riga was inhabited by the Livs, 
and that's uh, what, what is now Estonia. As agriculture grew up, uh, peasant farmers uh, started to group into villages. Uh, when Christianity took hold, the villages became parishes and the parish um, small community government really has survived up until the 20th century. By the late Iron Age, uh, hill forts were being built to protect villagers and their livestock. Uh, there's evidence of about 700 hill forts in Lithuania, about 200 in Latvia, and about 100 in Estonia. And, and this, this is, I think, a function of uh, really the, the size of the countries and the amount of population they had. There, it, it, it was obviously the farther south you went, the more populated it was. And so the more hill forts got built. Kurnow in uh, Lithuania was a very large hill fort and it was estimated there were 3,000 inhabitants, inhabitants in that area in the 13th century. Uh, the Vikings had substantial influence in this area from about 800 to uh, 1100 AD. Varangian uh, princely dynasty was formed in the Kievan Rus Rus in, uh, in this period. And uh, the, the early history of the Ukrainian area is that it was uh, basically kind of civilized by the Vikings coming through that area and gaining control of uh, small tribal groups that kind of had continuous conflicts going on amongst themselves and, and the Vikings uh, kind of were able to establish rule. Uh, one of the things I, I was reading about this week was that the early Vikings uh, brought ships down the Dnieper River and uh, when they got to the falls uh, above the Black Sea, they had to uh, actually take all the contents out of their their long ships and portage the long ship over the rapids. And uh, and then they got into the, the Black Sea and then went on to uh, Constantinople and traded with the uh, um, the empire in, in that area. And they said that they, this was an annual kind of uh, migration for the Vikings in this period from 800 to uh, about 1100. So in 1159, Henry the Lion, the Duke of Saxony, uh, so we have, we've got Germanic people from the center of Europe now moving up into this area. And he established Lubeck on the, the Baltic coast uh, in, in 1160 established this on one of the uh, island of uh, Gotland, which is in the Baltic Sea. And both of these were, were set up as trading colonies. In 1167, the French monk Falco was appointed as the Bishop of Estonia. And when you read, read about this history, it, it was kind of strange because he was appointed the Bishop of Estonia and there literally were no Christians in, in Estonia at this time. And, uh, his mission ended up being a failure, um, again, because he had nobody to uh, really to, to preach to or, and he wasn't very successful in conversions or anything. <coughs> in 1187, the Estonians from the island of uh, Sarima <coughs> were well enough organized and military strong enough that they actually went and uh, overpowered the uh, Swedish stronghold of Sigtuna, which at that time was the capital of, the, <coughs> of Sweden. And in, in about the same period, the Kurians from the Baltic area raided Denmark and were successful in uh, getting uh, wealth and whatnot and stealing it from the, from the Danes. <coughs> Because of all that was going on and, and the uh, kind of the wildness of the people in this area, the 
Roman Catholic Church uh, established crusades to the Baltic in, in this period of time. <coughs> so their, <coughs> their concern was uh, twofold. One, it was a conversion of the uh, pagans to Christianity, and two, they were concerned about the uh, growth and the reach of the Orthodox Church coming up through Russia. In 1199, Pope Innocent III proclaimed a crusade to defend the converts in uh, Livonia. And Albert von Buxhorvaden, uh, the third bishop of Livonia, and he was a nephew of the Archbishop of Hamburg, led the Swords Brothers, uh, a group of uh, that was patterned after the Knights of the Templar. And the Swords Brothers were monk warriors that pledged at a pledge of poverty and chastity. And the Sword Brothers uh, were allowed to keep a third of all the conquered lands for their support. So this is the first uh, group of uh, crusaders that, that came into the uh, Baltic area. In 1204, the uh, mission of Livonia became a permanent crusade. And so the, the Sword Brothers stayed in this area uh, after 1204. In 1206, the Lives were subjugated by the, by the Swords Brothers, and, and uh, they, at, at that time, allied themselves with the Swords Brothers. In 1208, the Litigallians uh, submitted to the Swords Brothers. In uh, 1217, uh, the South and Central Estonians uh, fell to the uh, Swords Brothers rules also. So you, the thing to keep in mind again about, about the Swords Brothers is these were people that were basically uh, Germanic uh, crusaders. So we had the start in this, this whole area of Estonia and, and in the Latvian area of, of German rule. Uh, in 1219, the Danish king, uh, Valdemar II, attacked northern Estonia. And uh, legend has it that a battle flag of red with a white cross descended from the sky. And this is known as the Danaborg, and this is the oldest state flag in existence. And uh, Valdemar built a, uh, a fort that would later be known as Tallinn in Estonia. In uh, 1220, the King of Sweden tried to establish control of uh, Northern Estonia. And he, he suffered a major defeat at the garrison of uh, Lahula at the hands of the uh, Sarima Estonians, again, these are the people who lived on this rather large island uh, uh, right off the coast of Estonia. In 1227, there was an open conflict between the Danes, the Sword Brothers, and the Archbishop of Riga. And the Sword Brothers seized uh, Raval and the Duchy of Estonia uh, from the Danish. Interestingly enough, the Swords Brothers never entered, uh, never numbered more than about 200 uh, uh, brothers, but they were annually reinforced by recruits from uh, many of the German principalities. And these recruits would come up and, and they'd spend the summer uh, crusading with the Swords Brothers. In 1289, the Order of the Hospital of St. Mary's was formed in Jerusalem by uh, Germanic crusaders uh, of the Holy Roman Empire. And this order would become known as the Teutonic Knights. So now we have the introduction of a, a second order of crusading uh, brothers. In 1226, the Polish Duke of Mazoya, uh, as, as we talked about when we're talking about the history of Poland, invited the Teutonic Knights into northeastern Poland to subdue the pagans in Prussia. And uh, this started the 
really the ascendance of the Teutonic Knights in this area. The Knights sought to uh, heal the rift that the Swords Brothers had with the Danes and the Pope. And they co convinced the uh, Swords Brothers to return the Duchy of Estonia to the, to the Danes. From 1237 to 40, the, the Mongol horde overran the whole Baltic littoral. Uh, they overran Poland, uh, Hungary. And uh, so this was the period of, of the Mongol invasion. In 1240, the Teutonic Knights, the Swords Brothers, and the some Danish vassals moved against uh, uh, Novgorod and uh, in 1242, the Novgorod prince uh, Alexander Nev Nevesky defeated the order uh, at the battle on ice. And this was like in, in uh, December, January period on Lake uh, Piapus. And uh, from what I had read about this, uh, uh, Nevesky's uh, troops were really very much outnumbered, but uh, he uh, he had the advantage of being in his in his own locale, fighting people who were were not uh, that familiar with the weather or uh, where he was at. In 1240, the Carians subjected were subjected by the uh, Teutonic Knights. So this was again the move of the Teutonic Knights moving up around Prussia and, and to the south end of the uh, Baltic Sea. Uh, in 1250, the Teutonic Knights targeted the Symbagations and the Lithuanians. Uh, the Lithuanians united under ruler Mendigus, and actually in uh, 1251, Mendigus was baptized by the uh, Teutonic Knights, and uh, Mendigus was uh, declared uh, king by the Pope in 1253. Uh, Unfortunately, about 10 years later, he was assassinated by one of his own relatives. And uh, because he was about the only one that was converted uh, to Christianity, the, Lith the Lithuanians remained pagans. So uh, in 1269, Cradenus became the supreme ruler of uh, Lithuania. Actually, this is, uh, I think an important point is about this period of in the 1250s on, Lithuania had advanced to the point uh, from a government standpoint that they had a, a single strong authoritarian ruler. In uh, 1290, the Semigallians, the fall to the Livonian Knights, uh, and many uh, of the Semigallians flee to Semigosia. So these are just, you know, areas where they could get away from the uh, advancing uh, knights. From 13 to 1386, uh, Lithuania remained the largest pagan nation in Europe. So from 1316 to 1341, Lithuania was ruled by the Grand Duke Gediminas. Uh, he built a citadel at Vilnius in uh, 1323, and uh, he invited the Hanseatic League to trade in Lithuania. He also welcomed Jewish settlers and, and Catholic priests who could uh, hold service for the uh, traveling um, um, merchants and whatnot, but not to proselytize uh, natives. And he expanded the border of uh, Lithuania into the Rus lands, so this, uh, this is basically, he took over the area that's now Belarus. Uh, the Teutonic An Knights at this time had annual campaigns against the Lithuanians. So we're talking about this 1300 to 1390 period. And they, they were not successful at all in uh, subjecting the uh, Lithuanians or in converting them to Christianity. So between 1340 uh, and 1392, the, the Lithuanians and the Polish contested uh, uh, to 
gained control of the lands uh, of Galich, uh, Bolinia, and uh, Podolia. And these, these were pieces of land that sat between the two countries. In uh, 1345, Algridus uh, succeeded uh, Gedminus as, as the uh, Grand Duke of uh, Lithuania, and he annexed more. He annexed more land, including most of uh, modern Ukraine. So Lithuania at this point had become a very, very large country, uh, reaching all the way from from the from the Black Sea up to uh, its northern extent, which was about where Latvia is today. In 1377, Jagalia succeeds Algridis as uh, Grand Duke, and uh, he uh, actually was going to ally with uh, Moscovy to uh, fight the Golden Horde, but he missed the Battle of uh, Kilikovo, where uh, for one of the first times, uh, uh, Moscovy actually bested the Horde and, and, and uh, actually beat them and sent them further east. In 1382, Degelia uh, jails his uncle, Castutus, and his uh, nephew, uh, Vitotus. His uncle is killed in jail, uh, and his, uh, his cousin escapes jail to take refuge with the Teutonic Knights. Uh, after two years of strife, Degelia returns the Vitotus' ancestral lands to him. And uh, in 1385, we have the union of uh, Kriva. This is when uh, Jagalia promised to marry Jagwida, the queen of Poland, who was at that time 11 years old. Um, and he pledged to become a Christian. He also pledged to merge uh, Poland with Lit Lithuania, and he, he would become King Wladyslaw II Jagalia of Poland. And when he um, marries Jagwiga, he takes up residence in Krakow and he appoints his brother, Skrigalia, uh, as the viceroy of Lithuania. And this uh, made his uh, nephew extremely unhappy and he revolted and formed an alliance with the Teutonic Knights. And this resulted in a civil war in Lithuania in uh, 1392 with uh, Jagalia offering a viceroyship to Vitautis uh, in, in exchange, he sent his brother Skrigelia to uh, Kiev as, uh, as the viceroy for the uh, Kievan uh, Rus area. In 1401, Jagelia names uh, Vitautis as the uh, Grand Duke of Lithuania, and he named himself as the Supreme Duke of Lithuania. So Vitaris uh, basically was given autonomy to uh, rule over Lithuania. Uh, and in 1410, Lithuania um, confronts the uh, Teutonic Knights at the Battle of Grunwald and defeating the Knights. And uh, this included the death of the Grand Master uh, Ulrich von Jungingen. Um, and of course, this. This is the beginning of weakening the strength of the Teutonic Knights in this area. In 1422, Poland and the Teutonic Knights reached a lasting peace at uh, Melno, and the Knights gave up claims to uh, Samogitia, but retained Memo, and the western border of Lithuania and Prussia was established at this point in time. In uh, 1492, Matautis uh, uh, gains the Holy Roman Emperor Sigmundson's uh, consent to be crowned king of Lithuania. And uh, the Polish nobles were not at all happy about this, and they, accept, they intercepted the crown that was being uh, sent uh, and 
so Vitalis and uh, Jigelia had to uh, basically uh, do a little negotiations and the Jigelia saw no harm, real harm in uh, having Vitalis be crowned king of uh, Lithuania as he knew he, he had no sons and there wasn't anybody that was going to automatically inherit the uh, throne of uh, Lithuania at this point. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, he, like I said, he tried to gain this uh, kingship in 1429. He was 79 years old at that time. He died a year later in, in 1430. So uh, I guess it was just kind of his last hurrah. So upon his death, uh, Lithuania descended into a decade of a uh, civil war over who would succeed uh, Vitalis. Um, so the two uh, aspir aspirants for the Grand Duchy were, were uh, Sigmundson, uh, Vitalis's brother, and Jigelia's brother, Sitragala. And uh, in 1435, Sigmundson defeats uh, Svitragala and becomes the Grand Duke, only to be assassinated five years later. It, it was tough being a ruler back. So in 1440, uh, Jigelo appoints his young, younger son, uh, Casimir, as the Grand Duke of Lithuania. And uh, in 1447, Casimir is elected as king of Poland. At that time, he gave many additional rights to nobles, including the uh, right to trial by peers, uh, full rights and titles to the land, and the right of authority over peasants. And uh, this, is, uh, this is really the start of real serfdom for the peasant farmers, uh, like I said, when the when the owners were given the rights over the peasants, uh, it it really started uh, what I would really consider to be almost slavery in uh, this part of uh, Europe. Uh, peasants were exempted from state taxes at this time, but uh, by being exempted from the taxes, they they had they were required to put in additional labor. So uh, at this period of time, a peasant was basically obligated about three days of work a week for the Lord that owned the land. And as time progressed, this went from three days to five days to during harvest season, uh, they had to work literally seven days for the for the uh, landowner. So at this point in time, we're, we're talking about uh, about 1450. The Lithuanian government had evolved to uh, a structure that included a grand marshal who oversaw the courts, um, and uh, he proclaimed uh, ducal decisions. Uh, next, there was a chancellor who ran the state administration. This was this would be the kind of the executive officer of the of the uh, Grand Duchy, and there was a treasurer who was responsible for the monies, and then there was a Grand Hetman who was the head of the uh, nobles' militia. So he was the military head of the uh, of Lithuania, and about twenty noble families monopolized the major offices. Uh, they had a lot of nobles, but there, there were like classes of nobles. And so 20, 20 of these noble families really ran the country. The uh, Grand Duke also appointed uh, leaders of the 12 different palatines, uh, which would be like counties. Uh, and, and that was an appointment for life. By 1517, Lithuania had 
uh, developed a council of lords that met yearly in a uh, sim, and they uh, dealt primarily with finances and military matters. Uh, Casimir IV Jagalia unified the Polish crown and the Lithuanian uh, Grand Duke's role. So at, at this point, uh, about 1520, uh, we have a single head of government for both Poland and Lithuania. In 1529, Sigmund the Old, uh, uh, was responsible for the development of a uh, statue of law for Lithuania. And this is uh, the state's first written legal code. In 1557, Sigmund August uh, implemented changes in agriculture whereby farmlands were to be su surveyed and uh, all the farmlands were divided into hides and, uh, and this led to the three field system of farming and it further ensurfed uh, the peasants. So this is uh, probably uh, some of the earliest requirements for actual surveying and, and uh, th this would obviously laid very clear titles and, and claims to the, the lords that actually had the land. So there wouldn't be any question on whose land was whose land. And in the 1588 Third Code of Lithuania it contained formal code for the serfdom of all peasants. So significantly in uh, 1453, the Ottoman Turks conquered Constantinople and uh, Ivan the uh, third of uh, Muscovy declares a uh, claims to all Orthodox land with uh, Rus ties. Uh, and Ivan defeats uh, the Mongol Tartars uh, during this period of time. And this Ivan the third is of course, Ivan the terrible. In 1494 and 1503, uh, Lithuania starts to uh, suffer some land loss to the Moscovy government. And uh, the conflict with the Moscovy government will last for about 30 years at this time. The uh, only real major loss was the fortress of uh, Smolensk in uh, 1514. So in this period of time, we have uh, Feudal Livonia, which uh, again, this is the area that's where Latvia is at now. And um, it was an area that was conquered by the Germans. Uh, and it resulted in four bishoprics of uh, Riga, Dorpat, also weak, and uh, Corland. So these uh, four territories were interspersed with the holdings of the Teutonic Knights, the area, uh, area of modern Latvia and the southern half of uh, Sony were known as Livonia at this period of time. And uh, Denmark at this time controlled the northern portion of Estonia. And it was noted, known as the Duchy of Estonia. Um, in this area, Christian churches were as it says, were few and far between, and the churches uh, did not have assigned priests. They had priests that uh, uh, traveled and roamed around. And uh, um, the first order that served in this area were the Cistercians, and they started in 1207, and they were followed by the D Dominicans. By the time of the Reformation in uh, 1517, there were uh, 30 monasteries. Uh, in Livonia. The uh, Swords Brothers, again, we're talking about, you know, crusaded, crusading knights. They actually had a headquarter in Riga. And uh, as crusaders and whatnot, 
they were interested in building uh, pretty decent fortifications. So during the 13th and 14th centuries, they built 150 stone castles. Um, and so this is in Latvia and, and uh, Estonia. And there were only 20 stone castles in all of Lithuania uh, by the 16th century. So the, uh, these orders were, were, were builders also. So uh, land donation to uh, vassals was uh, prevalent in Estonia due to the Danish uh, weakness in controlling the area. So most of the vassals were German people and uh, they were associated with uh, crusading orders. Um, and what, what you find is uh, this uh, donation of land for control to these Germanic people carried on right up to uh, the uh, start of the First World War. <clears throat> so feudal relationship developed rapidly with Estonians in uh, 1343. Uh, the, Estonia, the actual Estonian natives rose up and slaughtered uh, as many Germans and Danish settlers as they could because they didn't like being under uh, serfdom. And, uh, so they actually were able to get rid of a lot of the uh, people that were enslaving them. In uh, 1435, the Swords Brothers uh, had suffered a defeat in the Lithuanian Civil War. And uh, again, the Teutonic Knights would suffer a defeat in the Battle of Grunswald in about the same period of time. So by the middle of the 16th century, the population of Livonia, so again, this is an area that later became Latvia, was about 650,000. And the 16th century saw a decline in the Hanseatic League. The, the Hanseatic League was originally set up to trade in, uh, in uh, the Northern Sea area. So this was Danish basically Swedish, Danish, uh, and some of the Germanic people up in that area that, that had established the Anseatic League for trading. By the 16th century, the, the, the Baltic peasantry had lost almost all their rights. Um, and this was, a lot of this because of by the 16th century, this area had become the kind of the breadbasket of, uh, of all of Northern Europe. Uh, so there was a tremendous demand for grain exports. And so uh, the serfs were basically required to work uh, literally all the, the days between uh, St. George's Day on April 23rd and St. Michael's Mass uh, on September 29th. So, the, the period during the growing season, uh, they were basically slaves to the lords of, of the manor for those periods of time. During this period of time, the taxes on the peasant crops increased and uh, it put many of the serfs into debt. And one of the interesting things is your debt stayed with the family uh, on a generational basis. So if, uh, as, as a serf, uh, your tax debt was unpaid when you passed away, uh, your, your sons would inherit that tax debt. And of course, if they had additional debt, that would be passed on. So the serfs really uh, were, were in a real tough place financially. And during this period of time, Peasants were not allowed to leave the manor uh, where they lived without permission of the, the Lord of the land. Yeah. 
One of the things uh, that, that had transpired by the 16th century is that the peasants no longer had military duty to the Lord or the, or the manor. Uh, because of this, it became increasingly hard to attract uh, recruits uh, for the, the crusading orders. So with uh, the Reformation of uh, 1517, uh, Livonia underwent some dramatic changes. Uh, the city of Riga uh, decided to get rid of feudal overlords. And so they drove out the, uh, the, uh, the crusading order and, and they got rid of the Bishop of Riga. And they also dissolved the uh, monasteries. Now, if you think a little bit back to your, your history of England, these people were about uh, 50 years ahead of uh, where Henry VIII would be. So they, they were doing about the same thing that, that he did uh, 50 years later. Interestingly enough, in 1526, uh, Walter von Pittenberg, he was the master of the Order of Livonia, uh, became the prince of uh, the Holy Roman Empire. And this was really kind of interesting because he was a long ways away from the rest of the lands that made up the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and the fact that he was so far away proved uh, pretty fatal for him. Uh, so uh, Livonia was really ripe for the picking for more powerful neighbors. And in, in this period of time, the more powerful neighbors were Sweden and, and uh, Moscow. Um, and this is when the uh, Northern Wars started occurring. So in 1558, uh, Ivan the Terrible invaded uh, Livonia. And uh, this precipitated the collapse and uh, partitioning of uh, par parts of Livonia. In 1569, you had the Union of Lublin, which uh, politically merged Poland and Lithuania into a commonwealth. In addition, the Ukrainian holdings of the Lithuanian duchy were transferred to Poland at this point in time. I, I really wasn't able to find a lot of rationale why this happened uh, uh, in either my reading on Poland or, or uh, the Baltics, but uh, at, at this period of time at the Union of Lublin, when they tried to strengthen the uh, Commonwealth of the two countries, they decided to basically transfer the kind of the ownership of uh, um, the Ukraine to, to Poland. So in uh, 1607, the Polish uh, replaced uh, Chancery Slavic as their official language in uh, Lithuania. And they, they, they replaced Chancery Slavic with with Poland as the official language in Lithuania. 1629, uh, Sweden takes control of Livonia uh, as confirmed by the Peace of Altmark. Um, so at this point in time, Riga was actually the largest city in the Swedish realm. In 1545, the Swedes had taken control of Osel, and, uh, and when they did that, they gained control of all of Estonia. So at this point in time, we're talking about in the early 1600s, uh, Livland was, Livonia was now known as Livland, and Estonia was known as Eastland, and, and so this is... Uh, the terminology that the Swedish uh, uh, put on these particular lands. And Corland had gained a degree of independence, but would become a Swedish uh, fife after 1658. 
So again, this is a period that was known as the Northern Wars and whatnot, and in 1618 to 1648 uh, period transpired, which was known as the Thirty Year Wars, and uh, Sweden uh, gained control of the Baltic Sea at that period of time. So I think uh, we'll take a break here at this point, and we'll get back uh, um, on the Thirty Year Wars and. So uh, we'll see everybody back at four o'clock. I have a question. Um, you'd mentioned uh, something about a three field system. Yes. Do you know what that is? I had, that's a new term to me. I'm, I'm not really. I'm not really sh exactly sure what the free field system was, but I think it, it has to do with um, how crops were rotated. And, and so you had, you know, you had uh, crops on it one year, crops on it another year, and then the third year would be fallowed. And, uh, and, and that, that was a rotation that just was followed year after year after year. And I think that's what the, the notation of the three field system is. That's at least that's why that's my understanding of it when it's used in that context in uh, British history. Thank you. When when you mentioned it, I looked it up, and that's what it is. Yeah, I I, I was pretty sure that uh, it, it was the same context as as, as it is in uh, British history also. So one thing that I hope you're 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 sensing from from this flow of, of history in these three countries is that these countries were basically subjected to other people's power over the whole period of time, and 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 so they're they're probably rightfully considered as. Uh, borderlands they're they're you know they're in between powers and as as we've seen we've got the 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 germanic people through the the teutonic knights and the swords brothers we've got uh, the polish uh who basically controlled a great part of this area for, for many centuries and we've got the russians which are pushing into this area and and of course during this uh, period of the early 1600s, the Swedish army was incredibly strong in this part of the, the world and, and took over. So this is a, a theme that I think you will find just continues as, as we go through this. Um, after the 30 year wars, the, the Swedish uh, recognized the, the local nobles in Eastland and Livland, and they basically, uh, made up a uh, local corporate body and the uh, the diet that they created this is the swedish diet had 12, 12 members and these were members that were appointed for life and they answered to the uh, swedish governor and again keep in mind that these local nobles were german people who had gotten their because of the activities uh, of the Swords Brothers and the Teutonic Knights. So one of the interesting things uh, at this period of time is that the uh, Swedish were, by this period of time, were uh, Protestants, they were Lutherans, 
and they they imposed a, an education system on the peasant population. They they kind of decided everybody should really know how to read and write, and so they established an elementary school in every uh, parish, and uh, they established a teacher seminary in Dorpat in, in uh, 1684. I thought an interesting thing was during this period of time under Swedish rule that in the early 1700s, um, they, were, they were noted for a large number of witch trials and subsequent burning at the stakes. What, what was happening in uh, about this time in, uh, in Massachusetts and whatnot in the 1700s? We had witch trials going on there too. So I guess that was a sign of the times. You know, if they, the schools taught in Lithuanian language, or did they impose the uh, Swedish language? Or no, they they taught they taught in the local languages. So the the Estonians taught in in the language that they had, and the the Latvians were taught in the language they had. And of course, Lithuania, Poland were were still semi independent, although they were run o over by Sweden during the same period of time. But in Lithuania and Poland, they didn't impose one language. It was they had both languages in different parts of the. Yes, that's correct. So by 1700, uh, Sweden's neighbors were pretty much aligned against Sweden. To, so this this included uh, King Frederick IV of Denmark. Uh, Tsar Peter I of Moscovy and uh, Frederick August, Augustus, uh, the, he was the elector of Saxony and, uh, and at that time he was the king of uh, Poland, Lithuania also. So uh, this is a period of time in uh, 1700 when uh, uh, King Charles XII of uh, Sweden came to, to power and he was only 15 years old when he first became uh, king and, and these uh, people thought that they could uh, push him around. He actually ended up being a pretty, uh, pretty astute military leader. So he first attacked uh, Denmark in uh, April of 1700 and he forced Denmark to sue for peace uh, within uh, a month of when he attacked him. He next went after uh, Frederick Augustus uh, only to find that uh, when he went to attack him in Riga, he was gone. Uh, so he then, then he turned his attention to Tsar Peter and he defeated the uh, Russians in November in a snowstorm at uh, Narva in Estonia. Uh, so he then went back to Augustus in, in Poland and he became down, became bogged down in Poland. He also, at this period in time, the, the, the Swedish uh, pretty much uh, alienated themselves to the, to the average person in Poland. And his war got really worried, drugged down. Um, so he tried to uh, ally himself with uh, one of the uh, Lithuanian noble families and he, he he kind of picked the wrong family. Um, so these uh, nobles in uh, Lithuania allowed the R Russian uh, troops to enter Lithuania to drive Charles XII out. And uh, his, his troops stayed mired up in uh, Poland for seven years. And during the spare time, Peter the Great rebuilt his army, and then he attacked uh, uh, both uh, Livlin and Eastland. So by 1704, um, Russia really captured uh, everything but the major cities, and Dorpat was uh, sacked, and its population was deported to Vologda in uh, 1708. In uh, 1708, Charles uh, tried to invade Russia again, and uh, he... Uh, was trying to prevent a direct uh, engagement and he turned southward and he went into the Ukraine 
and here he was met by uh, Tsar Peter's army on the uh, 27th of uh, June of 1909, and the Swedish army fell to uh, Tsar Peter and uh, Charles XII uh, retreated to Moldavia, and where he stayed for the next five years uh, in exile. So Peter returned uh, the Baltic Swedish holdings and uh, and he takes over the lands of the of the Russians. Uh, so uh, so it, this is uh, interesting that about this time is so this is in like 1709, 1710, uh, the plague descends upon this area and uh, the result of the plague was that about a third of the people in Lithuania uh, die from either starvation or the plague. They, they had both things happening. And about half the population of uh, Livland and Eastland perished from the plague and starvation. So at this time, uh, Tsar Peter offers uh, capitulation terms to Eastland and Livland corporate corporations and, and nobles. Uh, and he again uh, upheld the uh, position of the Lutheran church and the uh, German language in these areas. And he uh, uh, basically agreed to allow the nobles to stay on their land and, and continue to run their, their land uh, as they had been. And he actually asked the, the nobles to come up with a registry so he knew who the people who had been nobles were and they, they developed a, a registry that went back several hundred years to establish that, that they were, the, in fact, they were the nobles that, that uh, were the lords of the land that they were on. And these particular nobles would uh, stay in place for uh, another 175 uh, years as uh, vassals to the czar. So in 1795, of course, uh, as we, we had, uh, had uh, last uh, week, uh, Poland was partitioned by Catherine the Great and the uh, Lithuania became a province of Russia at that point in time. Uh, Napoleon's army moved uh, on Russia in 1812 and uh, the Russian army by this time had 800 Baltic German uh, officers and uh, they, they were very much responsible for the leadership of uh, a great part of the Russian army in this period of time. And of course, uh, Napoleon fell to defeat in 1814. In uh, 1816, uh, starts agrarian reform in the Baltic states. Uh, I guess uh, the czar saw a need to uh, know who people were, and so peasants were given. Uh, uh, surnames at this point in time, and they were often the surnames of the German owners. So, so you have a lot of people in this area who have uh, ger German-sounding names that that were, you know, native Estonians or native Latvians. Um, so they got they got surnames but they still weren't uh, free to leave the land without the lord's permission in 1831 the polish and lithuanian army officers revolted against uh, russian rule and uh, their revolt was easily put down by the russian army uh, by 1850 the baltic germans made up less than seven percent of the populations but they controlled almost all the land, the politics and the culture in uh, Latvia and, and Estonia. In uh, 1865, the Tsar did away with corporal punishment for peasants. 
you couldn't beat your peasants any longer. And in uh, 1866, the peasants were actually given the right to elect township representatives in Estonia and Latvia. <coughs> in uh, 1863, the Polish and Lithuanian uh, again organized a revolt against the Tsar's rule, and they were again crushed. Uh, the Lithuanian leader, Kalinowski, was uh, captured, and, and he was hung on the spot when he was captured. And hundreds of others were executed, and several thousand that were involved in this uh, revolt were sent to Siberia. So this is this is the beginning of what I found where if you uh, acted up under Russian rule, you went to Siberia and you never came back. After the attempted revolt, the uh, Tsarist administration uh, took some real draconian measures. They, they banned uh, Lithuanian publications in the Latin alphabet. Uh, so if you were going to publish anything in Lithuania, it had to be in Cyrillic. And uh, this was a, an attempt to further Russify the uh, Lithuanian uh, area. The actual result of this was that Lithuanian uh, newspapers and books uh, continued to be published, but they were published in Prussia. Uh, and by 1904, there were over 4,000 publications in Prussia and Lithuanian, but only 55 in, in uh, Lithuania or in Russia, which I thought was somewhat interesting. Uh, language after this period uh, in Lithuania, I thought was of interest. In 1897, 42% of the people in Lithuania spoke Yiddish, 24% spoke Polish, 22% spoke uh, Russian or Belarusian, and just 8% spoke the Lithuanian language. So uh, keep in mind that uh, dur during this whole period of time, there had been a very large migration of uh, Jewish settlers that, that had come out of uh, uh, Western Europe because of uh, prosecution in Western Europe. And they, they'd come to basically this area because they were welcomed by the uh, Polish-Lithuanian uh, uh, government. And, uh, and they made up a very sizable amount of population. So it, it, this period of time, the Russians made a real attempt to rustify the entire Baltic uh, littoral in the 19th century. They built they built Orthodox churches in all the major Baltic cities, uh, even though there really weren't any Orthodox members to to fill the churches. But they felt the Russians felt that they had to have nice Orthodox churches in all their cities. Um, with the uh, unification of the German state in 1871, Russia moved to make sure that the Latvians and the Estonians uh, would not be absorbed into the German community. So this was a concern of the czars. So the uh, Latvian and uh, Lithuanian people or Estonian people had a much higher literacy rate than uh, compared to all the people around them. And again, this goes back, a lot goes back to the Swedish uh, influence of establishing uh, elementary schools in all of uh, Estonia and Latvia. So the Baltic Germans had a 95% literacy rate. The Catholic uh, Latvians had a 58% literacy rate. The uh, Lithuanians had about a 48% literacy rate. Only 29% of uh, Russians at this period of time were literate. And uh, at this point in time, 65% of Jewish men were literate and 37% of Jewish women could read. So in uh, the period of 1870 to 1877, uh, there were a lot of municipal statutes which change to allow non-German uh, Latvians and Estonians to uh, participate in their own local uh, affairs in their own local communities. 
but the, the Germans still maintained uh, near monopoly uh, uh, land ownership. So in 1897, uh, Estonia had about 960,000 people. Latvia had a million nine thirty. Lithuania had about 2.67 million people. And uh, the native Estonians were made up about 91% uh, of their population, 4% were German and 4% were Russian. Latvia was 68% natives, 6% German and 12% Russian and 7% Jewish. And Lithuania was 58% native Lithuanians, 15% uh, Russian, 13% Jewish and 10% Polish. So this is the picture as we uh, go into the uh, start of the 20th century. That really doesn't seem consistent with the uh, language figures you gave us. Only 8% in Lithuania spoke Lithuanian, apparently. And, uh, yeah. And I, most of them I, I are know. native. Huh? Yeah. I know that they aren't all that consistent. Um, So by the late 19th century, uh, migration had started uh, from people in this area to, to America. And I, and I thought this, this information is really kind of interesting. Uh, the, the migration started with the 1867 famine and, and it increased in uh, 1874 when all youth were obligated to military service in the Russian army. So illegal ex, uh, exit of uh, immigrants was easiest uh, for the Lithuanians because they went out through Prussia. And uh, Lithuanians uh, made up a, a large part of the immigrants from Eastern Europe. And they, they worked in the coal mines in Pennsylvania. They worked in the slaughterhouses in Chicago and they worked in steel mills in, in Pittsburgh. The, the, uh, First Lithuanian newspaper in the U.S. was published in 1879, and uh, the first Lithuanian theater play uh, was staged in, in the U.S. in 1889, and that was 10 years before a theater play would be uh, staged in Lithuania. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So between 1800 and 1914, um, a quarter of a million Lithuanians immigrated to uh, the United States. Some of the famous uh, Lithuanian Jewish immigrants were uh, Al Jolson, the singer. <coughs> and I did not realize that. Uh, the violinist, Joshua Heifetz, and uh, abstract artist, Mark Ruthko, and uh, anarchist, Emma Golden. So the final uh, quarter of the 19th century uh, saw rapid industrialization of Estonia and uh, Latvia. A uh, quarter percent of all Russian goods flowed through the Baltic ports. And Riga was the largest of these ports. The uh, socialist political parties came into being in the early 20th centuries. <coughs> uh, following the bloody uh, Sunday demonstration in St. Petersburg on uh, January 9th, 1905, there were where Imperial Gordons mowed down the protesters. So solidarity strikes broke out in Latvia. And this, uh, again, this was during the period when Russia was at war with Japan and, and actually lost the uh, Russo-Japanese War. Um, a few days after this January uh, Bloody Sunday event in uh, St. Petersburg, uh, 54 demonstrators were also killed in Riga. And uh, in October, 94 demonstrators Ravel were killed and five in Vilnius. So these, these are people that are demonstrating that are being killed by the Tsar's uh, military. So the political unrest uh, led to the uh, formation of the first uh, Estonian-Latvian 
Latvian and Lithuanian Congresses, which were conducted in uh, November of 1905. And so some of the changes that were uh, demanded as a result of these Congress were democratic elections, end of censorship, uh, a state of autonomy based on ethnic borders, the end of uh, Russification, and they wanted to uh, have native language uh, in schools as opposed to Russian. And they wanted land reform to end the ownership of uh, the privileged German uh, landowners. So during this period of time, uh, radicalized workers in Riga went on a rampage and they went around torching manor houses and lynching German clergy. Uh, Latvian peasants uh, banded together and they seized several provincial towns uh, from local authorities. Um, Estonians uh, rampaged, destroying manor houses and, and looting uh, the, the German aristocracy. By the end of the year, the, the czar's uh, control had resumed and uh, this resulted in the execution of 1,315 demonstrators. Uh, several thousands were sent to Siberia and many others fled to Europe uh, and the US. So the czar again imposed martial law in 1908 to uh, quell demonstrations. So in 1914, uh, the Russian army moved on uh, German territory in uh, Konigsberg. And uh, so this is the beginning of World War I. This area in Konigsberg is what's the Kaliningrad uh, Oblast at, at the present time. So the Lithuanian uh, Territory was occupied by the Germans through most of uh, World War I. Uh, Latvia was really ground zero for the Eastern Front. So the Russians and the Germans moved back and forth and fought over land in uh, Latvia during the First World War. And so the Latvians themselves were pretty enthusiastic about fighting uh, the Germans uh, after their experience in uh, 1905 with uh, the riots. Unfortunately, during this period of time, most of the industrialization that had taken place in the previous quarter century uh, was dismantled and moved to the interior of Russia. The, the, the czars were concerned that the Germans would capture all their new industries. Uh, and, and, in addition to the industries moving, they also moved the uh, Riga Polytechnic Institute to Moscow in 1915. 800,000 uh, Latvians abandoned their homes, and uh, especially those uh, in the Courland area, Courland area, and 300,000 Lithuanians uh, abandoned their homes uh, and took refuge in the interior of uh, Russia to escape the, the war. Estonia was uh, not highly involved in World War I, and it only became involved in uh, the tail end of the war in 1917-18 period. So the, towards the end of uh, World War I, the Bolshevik Revolution took place, and the Bolshevik uh, overthrew the, the Tsarist government in 1917 and they assassinated Tsar Nicholas and his family. Uh, at the same time, the leaders in uh, Lithuania, uh, Latvia and Estonia proclaimed independence from Russia. On the uh, 30th of March in 1917, uh, the provisional government in Petrograd uh, agreed to merge the northern half of Livland and Eastland to form Estonia. So this was um, a recognition of what the country of Estonia really was. Estonia replaced a German uh, dominated land tag with the provincial assembly made up of a half socialist and half other parties. So up to this point, 
well, this area had been basically governed by these German families that had been there for 175 years. And this, this, this is the end of that. Uh, Liblin Providence Assembly uh, held an election in September and 63% uh, of the people that were elected were Bolsheviks. And this, of course, this is the area that's now Latvia. Uh, in October 26 of 1917, the Bolsheviks took control of the Russian government. And they, they also took control of Estonia and Latvia. So in uh, November 15th of 1917, the Estonian Provincial Assembly declared authority over Estonia. And a few days later, the non-Marxists uh, met and they declared uh, authority of uh, Latvia and the peasant union leader, uh, Carlos Yomanis, uh, Oldmanis, uh, worked to determine self-determination uh, in uh, Lithuania. In 1918, the Latvian Bol Bolsheviks uh, gained approval to merge Latgale into Livland and Courland to become Latvia and to accept uh, Latvian as the official state language. The German army uh, advanced in Latvia and Estonia during the uh, Bolsheviks uh, uh, campaign and, and the Bolsheviks kind of abandoned uh, these uh, province when the German army moved on them. So in uh, February of uh, 24th, 1918, Constantine Patz uh, used this brief period of time to, to uh, uh, declare independence for Estonia. The, the Russian provincial government had denied Lithuania's request for independence. Uh, the Germans controlled Lithuania, and they decided to let the Lithuanians uh, come together to declare independence. And the uh, Lithuanians elected a 20-member Teribah, uh, which was headed by Antonis uh, Smetona. So on December 11th, 1917, the Tariba declared independence with uh, close ties to Germany. Uh, the Germans planned on using this as a bargaining chip in talks with the Russian Bolsheviks. Um, so on February 16th, 1918, Lithuania declared independence. And uh, th then the Germans rejected the declaration at first, but then they agreed to, to independence in December of uh, 1917. Germany proposed a plan to uh, replace uh, Wilhelm, the Duke of uh, Uruk, and uh, he was Count of Wittenberg. He, they were going to place him on the throne of Lithuania as King Mendegus II. And uh, on March 3rd of 1918, the Lenin's Bolshevik government reached a peace accord with Germany at the Treaty of Bruska Litovsk, and uh, Russia ceded uh, Lithuania, Courland, Riga, and Estonia, an island of, to German control. And then on the 27th, a, a supplementary treaty ceded Estonia and Lublin to German control. Uh, Lenin's thought at this period of time that he was more interested in worldwide. Uh, revolution and he decided that well he he could just cede all these these plants because it, he knew that within years he was going to overrun them anyway so the uh the uh intent powers of uh, france and britain objected to german control of the territories mm -hmm. and uh, in uh, november 12th of uh, 1918, the Germans agreed to uh, to an armistice, and this is this is at the time, of course, that the Kaiser uh, stepped down from uh, control of Germany, and uh, um, the the Lithuanian Taribov decided to rescind the election of the king, and the Taribov created a three-man uh, presidium to govern the country, headed by Smentona. Uh, Estonian government was formed, headed by Pats, and the Latvian uh, National Council uh, was formed in 
it excluded all Bolsheviks. And it was headed by a fellow by the name of Caxter. And he was the chairman and uh, Ominous was in charge of forming provincial government. <clears throat> Actually, at this time, uh, Latvian was under the control of August Winning. Uh, he was the German uh, Eighth Army representative. At war's end, the authority to the actual Estonian, Latvian, and uh, Lithuanian governments. Uh, so the Bolsheviks renounced the Treaty of Brest, uh, Litovsk, and the uh, Red Army then advanced on uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The interesting thing is, of course, this is uh, 1918. The Bolsheviks managed to really alienate the, literally everybody in the uh, Baltic littoral. The Baltic peasants were looking for uh, reforms that would take the farmland out of the hand of the um, the lords and, and manors and, and uh, uh, allow them to have ownership of, of the land that they actually farmed themselves. Uh, the Soviets view of this is they wanted to collectivize all land and all land would be owned by the state and uh, no one would have land ownership. So the Soviet uh, rule didn't last very long at, at this point in time. The Estonians uh, sought the aid of the Finnish and the British militaries, and Estonia drove the Red Army out of Estonia uh, by the spring of 1919. The, the German army stopped the Red Army's advance in Lithuania, sort of uh, short of canals, which was at that time the uh, seat of the Lithuanian government. And the Polish army drove the Bolsheviks out of uh, the area around Vilnius in uh, April of 1919. Um, German uh, and Free Corps, this, uh, they called them freebooters. Uh, these were volunteers. Uh, they prevented the Red Army from totally overrunning Latvia. Uh, so in April, the Free Corps toppled the ominous uh, government and drove Ominous uh, into uh, exile, who he spent his exile on a British ship in the, uh, the uh, Baltic Harbor. Uh, and the Red Army was uh, driven into Latvia by the German regular army and the Estonian army advancing from the north. So you had the Germans pushing the uh, Russians back to the east and the, the Estonian army coming down and pushing them uh, to the east and, and from the north. At this point, the uh, <coughs> German army and Estonian army met at uh, Cisus in uh, Latvia, and the uh, Estonian army refused to let the Germans uh, head back north. And uh, the Entente powers uh, brokered a truce obligating uh, Germany to withdraw to Courland and the ominous government. Uh, return to power in Riga. So Ominous was able to get off the British ship and go back to uh, uh, his government position. So at this time, the Germans are pretty much out of uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, but they weren't done in the Baltics. They tried to uh, put together a Russian volunteer Western Army Corps, and uh, this was to be part of the White Army that was going to restore the Tsar's Russia. And uh, as we know, the White Army failed miserably against the Bolshevik Red Army. So uh, contrary to what a lot of us had, had probably heard uh, when we were in school, the Treaty of Versailles, Versailles had literally nothing to do with the independence of the Baltic states. Uh, uh, these, these states really had earned their independence through their own actions um, at the end of the war. And the Treaty of Versailles really, Versailles really had very little to do with it. So they 
all three Baltic states started out with parliamentary uh, governments with uh, many political parties. The parties were so numerous that it was uh, very difficult to uh, come up with a stable majority. And uh, so the governments uh, usually lasted no more than a year uh, before another election and uh, more fragmenting of the government occurred. In 1926, the, the Lithuanian electors actually uh, chose a minority coalition to govern. And this coalition tried to undo many of the previous Christian Democrats programs. And the coalition uh, tried to reduce the size of the military, especially they wanted to reduce the number of generals that they were supporting. And this was very unacceptable to the junior officers corps in the military and they rose up and staged a coup. And the result was that uh, they asked uh, Smintona and Voldemaris, uh, <clears throat> two of the elder statesmen to uh, take over the government. And in uh, August of 27 to 1927, Smintona dissolved the parliament and he took control of uh, uh, Lithuania and Lithuania was basically uh, governed by uh, a group of uh, of colonels uh, under the supervision of Smintona from this period of time till the start of the uh, Second World War. Uh, parliamentary debauchery came under threat in Estonia and Latvia more more due to the uh, depressions of the economic depression of the 30s. Uh, in Estonia, a league of veteran called the VAP uh, led a con constitutional amendment to create a strong office of president. And uh, after a countrywide referendum, 73% uh, of the people voted to uh, have a strong new president. And a uh, new parliament was elected in 1934. The uh, Prime Minister Pats uh, and the presidential candidate, General Ladnair, uh, declared martial law and they arrested the leader of VAP and they postponed elections and Pats basically took over. Um, two months later, Omanis uh, advocated a stronger presidency for Latvia and uh, he had declared a state of emergency in May of 15th of 1934, and he took over control of the Latvian government. So at this point, uh, by 1934, we have three uh, strong men, and they basically stuffed, snuffed out democracy um, and it neutralized the challenge of younger politicians. And they stayed in power until the uh, start of World War II. One thing that happened during this period of time was the uh, land reform. All three Baltic states uh, during the interwar periods uh, uh, confiscated the uh, manor land. And uh, the average manor at this period of time in these three yards, the average size was 2,000 hectares and the uh, average peasant farm was 30 hectares or less. So the reforms took the land from the estates uh, and the church for distribution to the peasant farmers. Uh, Estonian and the Latvian estates were allowed to retain 50 hectares and the Lithuanian estates were allowed to keep 150 hectares. Um, the choice properties went to decorated war veterans and then the peasants received a land allotment with the favorable terms, they were they were actually given uh, several decades to repay for, for the land that they were uh, given. <clears throat> and interesting enough, in the uh, 1920s, this uh, land redistribution created a uh, agricultural middle class, which none of these countries had ever had before. So state security was important to these uh, independent countries. Uh, so Estonia and Latvia viewed Poland as their major ally and Lithuania viewed Poland as their mortal enemy and looked to Russia as an ally. Um, 
because of this difference in perception of who, who our allies are, it kept the three Baltic states from coming together and producing some sort of mutual defense initiative. The uh, three thought that they do like the uh, Nordic countries and Switzerland and, and declare neutrality and, and, and that would help keep them from becoming in, in, uh, involved in neighbor struggles. So between uh, 1939 and 53, the three Baltic countries were basically caught between a hammer and an anvil. Uh, they were they were in a bad position. Uh, like I said, this is where you really find that these countries were uh, between two major powers, and and they're they're the the border between those powers. So uh, in uh, 1940, the Ribbentrop and uh, Molotov got together and uh, negotiated agreement between the two. And as part of the agreement, uh, they, they agreed not to uh, uh, go to war against each other. And then they had a whole bunch of secret side agreements in their agreement that basically split up how the lands around their borders would be apportioned between them. And so the uh, uh, Germans agreed that they would take uh, most of Poland and the Russians would get uh, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania and Belarus and the Ukraine. So the Germans attacked uh, Poland on uh, September 1, 1939, and they, they went on an all-out campaign and basically totally overran Poland in a very short period of time. At the same time, the, the USSR attacked uh, the eastern side of Poland in uh, September of uh, 1939, and then they invaded uh, Estonia uh, on the 29th of September, and they invaded Latvia on the 6th. The USSR is dealing with Lithuania was a little different. They offered to return Vilnius to the Lithuanians uh, for the Lithuanians' cooperation. At this period of time, the, the Germans repaid it, created 14,000 people from Estonia. 50,000 from uh, Latvia, and uh, they basically repatriated these people to uh, Poland and Germany. Uh, and only the, the very old were left behind, so you basically had these German families that had been in this area for, you know, five, six, seven hundred years were now returned to either Poland or Germany. And as it says, it in 700 uh, years of German rule in the Baltics. And uh, in 1941, 50,000 Germans uh, who were mainly farmers uh, in, uh, in the Lithuanian area were returned to uh, Germany. By the spring of 1940, Stalin insisted on uh, further Baltic concessions, including the uh, uh, seating of the government's favor to the Soviet policy, and he also increased the number of Soviet troops in the Baltic. He, he basically made uh, the three countries of the Baltic literal uh, uh, his military base for protection against uh, potential German invasion. Uh, Lithuanian's presence, Simtona was the only one that really uh, tried to resist uh, Stalin's uh, incursion into his state, but he could uh, get no support from his military commanders. And so he fled uh, uh, Lithuania to the, to the West. During this period of time, they, the Russians tried to uh, overrun Finland and the Finns uh, 
waged a historic uh, winter campaign against the Russians, and then they sued for peace, but they had to give up a lot of territory. But they did repay, re, remain their independence. Uh, in 19, uh, June of 1940, the Soviets uh, uh, basically had taken over the Baltic governments. And uh, because of the fact that there were so few communists uh, in the three Baltic countries, all the government positions were were basically being filled with people from Russia who were moved from Russia to the Baltic countries to, to run the government. <clears throat> so at this point, the the three Baltic states were incorporated as as uh, socialist republics. So they became uh, three more of the republics of the Soviet Soviet Union. So at this time, the uh, Soviets confiscated all farmlands over 10 hectares and uh, placed them in collective farms. The uh, Soviets also purged the uh, Baltic military. They basically took all the command staff and uh, either executed them or sent them to Siberia. And they kept all the, the enlisted people and, and uh, uh, converted them into a rifle corps. So basically, the the Russians viewed the Baltic military as nothing but cannon fodder. During this period of time, the Soviets' uh, means of obtaining obedience was the use of just pure, unadulterated terror on the people. And uh, in the early hours of June of 1941, uh, the terror climaxed. And they basically knocked on people's doors at, at uh, about one o'clock in the morning. You were told you had uh, an hour to get a suitcase packed. And they deported 10,000 Estonians, 15,000 Latvians, and 18,000 uh, Lithuanians to Siberia for a term of uh, at least 25 years. Um, most of these people that were deported uh, in this series of deportation uh, didn't survive more than a year or two. Most of them uh, either starved to death or froze to death. <clears throat> in uh, June of 22nd of 1941, Hitler uh, attacks the USSR, and within a week, the uh, German army had uh, overrun Lithuania. A couple weeks later, they'd overrun Latvia. And uh, Estonia fell in September. The remaining Baltic citizens that were still there, uh, that, that were capable of it, had joined up with the Nazis uh, as they viewed the uh, Nazis as the lesser of two evils uh, between uh, the Bolsheviks and the Nazis. The, the Lithuanians were best prepared for regime change. They actually had organized an underground. Uh, uh, government and the day after the German invasion the uh, uh, Lithuanian uh, underground proclaimed a provincial government <laughs> the Germans were actually caught off guard by the fact that they're organized but the uh, underground Lithuanian government refused to uh, collaborate as a mere puppet for the uh, Germans and they disbanded and So part of uh, Hitler's overall plan for what he called Oisland was the elimination of the Jewish and Roma populations. Uh, so the liquidation of Jewish uh, was, uh, was a priority as uh, the Russian army moved against Germany in 1944. The retreating Germans made sure that the remaining Jewish uh, people in this area were all moved west to work camps and to death camps at Auschwitz. Uh, Sudhoff and Dachau. So 90% of, 95% of all Lithuanian Jewish uh, residents uh, at the start of the war were exterminated. So this was a loss of 200,000 people in uh, Lithuania. Um, Russian POWs uh, fared just about as bad. 170,000 uh, Russian POWs were also killed by 
there were Druidic Nazis in Lithuania. So during this uh, Second World War, the Balts were, they were basically forced to fight on both sides. Uh, many of them uh, were forced to serve in the Red Army. And when the Germans uh, moved on the Red Army, the uh, Balts that were in the Red Army deserted and went to the German side. By uh, 1944, the Soviets had uh, recaptured the Baltic Littoral, and uh, many of the Balts sought to reestablish independent states similar to 1918 experience. Stalin had entirely different plans for the Baltic nations, and the independence leaders were rounded up and arrested by the Red Army, and the, most of them were executed at that point in time. The Soviet military, uh, at the end of the war, immediately subscripted any Baltic youth uh, who were not in the army for replacements in the Red Army, as since the Red Army had lost a lot of uh, people, they needed to replenish their troops. And uh, many of the youth uh, during this period of time fled into the forest, and they became part of the national partisans that tried to uh, uh, resist the Red Army after the uh, end of the war. Uh, interesting enough, the, the, the book I read said that the last member of the partisans that were trying to resist the Soviet army uh, lasted until 1986. And this was somebody that actually lived that long and it made, stayed in the forest as a, as a uh, uh, combatant partisan uh, and, and just basically finally got old and died in 1986. So during uh, the war, the Baltic states uh, lost a tremendous amount of their population. So it, it, there's an estimate that as many as 50% of the people in the Baltic uh, littoral were either killed or had migrated out of the area during the war. So at the end of the war, the Soviets started moving a lot of Russian people into the uh, Baltic states. So again, the key government posts were all filled with uh, communists appointed uh, from the Kremlin and, and they, they, they just didn't have the party people that were in, in the three countries. Uh, so that's how they filled the government position. So this is again, this is a map of uh, the uh, area after the war was over. So you have a, the top here, you have Estonia, you have Latvia, Lithuania, then a little little red uh, sliver down here is the uh, Kaliningrad Oblast, which is part of Russia today, the Belarusia and Ukraine. Again, keep in mind that Lithuania, Belarus, and Ukraine for centuries was all one country. Uh, Soviet control continued to, to rely on terror. In uh, 1950 30, the Estonian artists, writers, actors, musicians, and university faculty were banned from employment in their professions. Um, the Baltic businesses and farms fell under Soviet five year plans. The, so in uh, part of one of these plans, uh, they, they had the Russians had what was called Operation Preboy. This was surf, and uh, this was to basically gain control of all the peasant farmers and, and whatnot. So in 1949, 20, 21,000 Lithuanian, 42,000 Latvians, and 32,000 Lithuanian farmers and their families were resettled to Siberia. And again, this was one of these knock on the door in the middle of the night things, pack a suitcase and they put them on trains to Siberia. So by 1952, all farmland had become part of the collective system. In 1953, Stalin dies and overt, overt terror uh, as a method of uh, keeping people in line was greatly reduced. <clears throat> In uh, 1958, the farm started actually paying a cash wage. 
and uh, the Baltics uh, at this point just kind of settled into Soviet existence. Uh, and we, as we know from our, our own history, uh, the Soviet uh, leadership gradually became a gerontology. And uh, we had Brezhnev who uh, passed away in 1982, Andropov in 84, uh, Chernenko in 85. So if you look like, you know, these guys were, they were all at the end of their life and, and they'd get appointed as general secretary and within a year they were gone. So that's when uh, Mikhail Gorbachev became uh, the general party secretary in uh, 1985. In 1986, he uh, instituted Glasnost and uh, Perestroika. And uh, so the, Time of five o'clock has come up and we will continue with uh, the rest of this uh, next week. And uh, then we'll move on to uh, the Ukraine and, and, uh, and then we'll start on the Eastern European satellites uh, uh, next week also. So I'd like to wish everybody a very nice weekend this weekend. And uh, again, Ted will get the uh, recording up uh, and I'll, I'll get your uh, uh, PowerPoint out to you uh, sometime Saturday. And uh, Yeah, get me the email of the uh, woman who joined the class because she might want to look at the uh, uh, recordings. She, yeah, uh, I'll do that. <clears throat> so, Jim? Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Observ observation just from today. <laughs> So yes. one of the things on the one where you're talking about the predominant language of that area, I mean, it struck me that it was Yiddish. Yes. And then it struck me that that was the area that was the Pale of Settlement. That's right. That's where Catherine the Great had basically relocated all the Jews, and that's where they had to live. So, okay, that made sense. Why? Yiddish. Yeah, why 42% of the people spoke Yiddish? Yeah. yeah why, why Yiddish? Okay, but then the next further on talking about stuff, and it was kind of like, okay, the repatriation of the Germans from some of the Baltic states. Yeah, notice repatriation. Yeah. Okay. How many people were actually left there? Because first the Germans repatriated, and then the Russians basically kidnapped and sent off to Siberia, and it's like, who's left? Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is they, they've reduced the population by about 50% yeah. of, of that whole big, huge area. And, I mean, was, and, it, and, you know, like the Germans left behind all the old people. Yep. And then those probably were some of the people that got sent to Siberia and had very short lifespans in oh, yeah. Siberia. But yeah. then, you know, some of the younger people probably got sent there also. So I was like, wait a second. They, between Germany and Russia, they kind of decimated the population by either repatriating or kidnapping and sending off to Siberia. Well, Did I get uh, that right? Yes, and, and go, going back again to some comments I made last week, remember Hitler Hitler kind of had a hierarchy of, of who, who he thought should survive. And, and the, the, the bottom of the list, who, who shouldn't survive were the Jewish people. And then the next were the Roman people, the Roma, uh, the, you know, the gypsies. And then next to that were the Slavs. He, he, you know, he thought all the Slavic people were, were just, just a step above the Jewish people. So his whole idea was he was going to go east, capture all this land, and then resettle it with, with German people. And, and um, he, 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 so it, it's no wonder that these populations in, in this area that was between the, these two powers uh, just had their population decimated. I think you should recheck those uh, those language numbers, though. I don't think it was 8% Lithuania doesn't seem. 
Right. My grandparents were Yiddish speaking Lithuanians who, who left in 1905, but there was there were quite a few Lithuanian speakers around then too. I, I know that came right right out of the 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 text that I that uh, that I used for for the figures. So uh, it, it is surprising, you know. And is there any idea how many of these repatriated Germans actually wanted to go to Germany? No, I, I, I just sense that. I mean, if they've uh, been there for centuries, they're, they're, I, they're like me. I have German heritage, but if you're going to repatriate me to Germany, okay, I can tell you good morning and good evening and thank you and please, and that's it. And so yeah. I, 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 I visit, I would, I would like to go back and visit again, but don't repatriate me because I don't know. Well, just, just keep in mind though, that, that all these people had gone through one iteration of, of, of Bolshevik rule. So when it came back around, gee, do I have to live under the Bolsheviks again? They knew how bad it was living under the, the Bolsheviks from the their experience. Versus the devil you don't. Yep, yep, exactly. So I think that's why uh, a lot of them opted to go ahead and go along with repatriation. Yeah, it's, you know, it's a pretty sad part of history, really, when you think about it. Okay, well, have a good weekend and uh, we'll continue. Uh, Next Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.